So, hi, Laura, and welcome to our podcast. Hello. <laughs> Thank you so much for taking the time to be with us uh, today. Um, so, could you start by telling us a bit about who you are and uh, what do you do for the people that don't know who you are? Well, um, I'm a tennis professional. Um, I play tennis for a living, um, and uh, but apart from that, I although I started very early to play tennis uh, with three years, um, had a really early career. Um, of course, there were other uh, things in my life that were also important. I I was just doing a lot of different sports when I was young. And um, I tried as, as well as possible to uh, do my school parallelly to my um, professional sport. So I, uh, you know, I got the highest uh, school degree. And um, then, uh, yeah, tennis was always my, my job um, and, of course, also my passion. Um, but uh, I had also phases where it didn't go so well. So I uh, studied psychology in between. So I would say I have... Uh, Tennis was, of course, always a, a huge part in my life, but there are definitely other things I managed to to do along the way. And um, and now I'm 32, uh, old uh, tennis uh, player, or <laughs> starting to to be in the you know in the further age, <laughs> and uh, yeah, still grinding and fighting out there. <laughs> of course. So you say you started tennis when you were three years old. Um, why did you start playing tennis? Uh, at the beginning? Well, uh, I come out of a tennis family, let's say. They, my parents, uh, they were really passionate sports people, uh, particularly uh, tennis, um, but also other sports. And um, But they were not professionals or anything. They were just uh, hobby players. And I have an older brother. He's uh, five years older. And so uh, pretty much when um, when I arrived in this world <laughs> and in this family, uh, everyone was already doing a lot of sports and uh, spend a lot of the free time on on uh, in sports facilities. And then um, it, it went more and more toward tennis because uh, that was just a sport that we were able to do in the places where we lived. We lived um, not always in Germany. And um, so it, it was just also about, you know, what's what's available. And tennis was one of the, the sports that was consistently available and um yeah that's how I kind of fell into it my brother played and I hung out on the bench by the court and um yeah at some point said screamed that I want to play too <laughs> and okay. uh, that's how I kind of you know grew into the sport naturally okay that sounds good and when did you know that you wanted it to be your job you wanted to be professional in that sport um, I would say that was around when I was 12 because, um, I mean, I was always playing a lot of tennis. I was always good, um, you know, even when I was seven, eight years old and the first, um, regional selections happen where you, you know, get training from the federations and you're like picked because you're better than other ones and all that. I had gone through that for a couple of years. And um, with 12, I, I played already international events. I um, won the Orange Bowl. So I showed that I'm one of the uh, best international juniors also. And um, for me personally, things happened when I got trouble in school because I was missing so okay. often mm -hmm. that I got in trouble with the not so much with the teachers actually but more with the other students because they wouldn't accept that there is one mm. student that can go and come when she wants and that was uh, causing a lot of uh, tension in the class uh, or between me and the class and um, and that's when we had to change something and I told my mom I came back from school one day and I said I don't want to go back there they are <laughs> killing me okay. um, basically bullying me um, although I'm really not at all the type to be bullied I have a lot of <laughs> self-confidence I was always standing up for myself I'm not the nerd sitting in the yeah. corner crying and getting bullied so I was like this is this is not me like I gotta ch we gotta change something and that's when I I changed school basically for ten is um and I went into a, um, a program that helped me to be able to practice uh, twice a day tennis and and do the school on the side um okay so basically when that happened like when um you know when I had to change the school and I was like okay I gotta do something here in order to 
be better be able better to practice better and to be more efficient for my tennis that's when i realized hey this is really my main priority the school it's all something that's on the side but i want to be a professional tennis player and this is the start of my career and i really i changed where i live i changed my school all these things or my parents changed them for me um me asking them okay. to do that uh, and uh, and that's when i realized hey okay i really want to be professional and this is not working for me anymore okay okay so Through your career, you have competed uh, worldwide at the biggest stage uh, in tennis and you have been really successful in doing so. You have won two single titles and six uh, double titles on the WTA Tour and also many titles on the ITF circuit. Um, mm -hmm. 2016 was the year that you had a breakthrough, if mm -hmm. you may call it like that, mm -hmm. and you won your first W title single. Mm -hmm. uh, what was it like for you? And was it like a dream come true, knowing that you've been uh, chasing that dream since you were 12 years old? Um, yeah, I would say I, I had a really difficult career. And um, and I had uh, in the years 2012, 13, 14, I actually decided to, to stop uh, playing tennis, at least on a professional level, in the sense of, you know, chasing WTA rankings and trying to be on the international ranking as high as possible. I um, So it was for me a point in my life and also in my tennis life where I really took a, a very serious decision that was um, the opposite of everything I had done until until then. And then uh, for for um reasons i can't even i can't even say exactly i kind of uh, stumbled back into professional tennis after i took a break and and i studied and i did a lot of other things um and then somehow i i i got back into the the small little tournaments and i played really well and then um in 2015 i had finished my studies at university and that was also the point when i started to play better and better i played uh, grand slam qualifying again and 2016 then that was the continuation of this um and was a really really great year for me with um started out already well and and i i was at the olympics i won my first wta title i mean a lot of great things mm -hmm. happened in that year and it was for me um It was like a little bit i don't know what how you call that in english a little bit of remedy for the All course, the yeah. pain that I had gone through in the years before, I have to say, I was, um, I, I wasn't, uh, thinking anymore that I can achieve those things, actually. And I was playing more for the fun of it rather than for the results of it. And I think that's exactly why it was successful. That's the, okay. that's the, um, The, uh, how do you say the art of it is to play and yeah, enjoy yeah. it no matter what the result is but I wasn't able to do that un until that point and um, yeah I have to say it was a dream come true it was a lot of um, pride and and yeah the feeling of remedy for something that I finally was able to um, experience that I was working really hard for and that I had had let gone already I had let it go i said okay this is just not happening for me yet. and that's all right um it, it it was a not easy to let it go but pretty much the the moment i let it go it came to me and that was a really nice feeling and i really was very happy in 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 that time yeah, yeah of course that's am that's amazing so you talked a bit about it but you also represented germany Uh, mm -hmm. at the Fed Cup and also at the Olympic Games. Mm -hmm. um, first of all, what is like for you to getting to represent your country, Germany, at the international level? Well, it's always a, it was always a dream for me to represent my country. And, um, and I was pretty much my whole career uh, watching on the sideline and following Fed Cups or, uh, you know, I would spend uh, literally two weeks in front of the TV watching uh, Olympic Games, be not only tennis, but just all sports. And um, I, I would, yeah, basically just be sitting at home following it from there and, uh, and uh, always wish to, to have that chance to be one of the best that, you know, the, your country puts the trust in you to, um, to uh, represent uh, it. 
And um, so that that made me very proud when I finally made that step to um, be able to get nominated in Fed Cup. And of course, also uh, get nominated for the Olympic Games, which is more... Um, I just had, yeah, I just worked my way uh, up so quickly and, and so well that I guess I I deserved that uh, that spot. But I, until now, it's for me, uh, it's a different, it's a different way I step on court when I play for my country. Um, it's a different feeling when you, um, when you wear your national, uh, you know, the, the national colors on your suit it's a different um, responsibility you have. Usually in tennis, you are very, um, you're a single athlete. You are responsible for yourself. You're playing for yourself. You have maybe a little team. And of course, many people who support you, your family and friends and all that. And uh, But in the end, it matters only for you. If you win or lose, you win and it's your advantage. You lose and it's your disadvantage. It doesn't matter uh, for anybody else. And you can fix it also the next week at the next tournament. Um and uh, and if you play for the country it's a different thing you just have responsibility f- for yourself but also for your teammates and and really for the whole country so that's a different in a way a, a lot of pressure also because you don't want anyone um to let anyone down but it's also a great honor that feeling to to be that person out there that everyone's pu- putting their trust in i always uh I always found this is a great <laughs> or an intense mix of emotions, you know, and of pressure also. But I enjoy it and I'm, uh, I, I love all the occasions. I, I love team competitions in general. And so I always really enjoy the, the Fed Cup and, and, and having a team around me for that week. Of course, of course. And the, obviously, um, the Tokyo Olympics being reported to next year, is that something that you have? in your mind as well right now or, or not at all? Well, it's somewhere in the back of the mind. Um, Rio was a, a great experience. Um, as I said, for me, it was really always a, a big dream just to participate um, in an Olympics. And um, and it was, yeah, it was a dream come true. And Rio was a, just a great experience to spend time with all these different athletes. I just love sports in general. I don't, I mean, I like tennis uh, and it's the sport I grew up into Mm -hmm. or I grew to be a professional at but I'm really just fascinated by all kinds of sports so the Olympics for me it's it's amazing to see all the other athletes how they train how they eat how they are and their competition um this is a a wonderland for me so um I really really enjoyed uh, Rio and I also you know I had my own competition going on but I also really took the time to um to experience the whole Olympics. So I went there early and I stayed long um, to watch other competitions after okay. my own was was done. And, you know, I would do the same if I was nominated for Tokyo and I would definitely really, really love, would love to go. So um, the Olympics, for me, it's something amazing and very special. It's not necessarily that all tennis players feel about like that because... Technically, for us, the Olympic Games is is nothing big. Like, you know, we make a lot of money. We have other big competitions like the Grand Slams and the Masters and all this stuff. Of course, yeah. For other athletes from other sports, the Olympics is... They train four years just for that competition. In tennis, it's not like that. But for me, the Olympics have a really high... um, play a high role but it's not that every day I think about you know the Olympics if I play well I am allowed to go there if I don't play well not that's as easy as it is but I would I I just try to play uh, you know my daily job my daily tournaments or weekly tournaments so well that I can qualify for it again because the experience for sure is is something no one can take from you anymore of course of course I can completely understand um so in 2017, you won your second and biggest single WTA tournament in uh, in your hometown in uh, Stuttgart after a world card entry. Um, what was that like winning in your hometown? That was amazing. <laughs> yeah, it was a uh, it was probably the best thing that can can happen to a player, apart from you know winning a slam or or, <laughs> or the Olympic Games. Let's say. <laughs> I mean, it was um it was just. Uh, craziness uh, over a whole week how the people 
react to my game, how they celebrated me. And, and again, a, a huge uh, mix of enjoyment, but also amazing pressure. Like you really don't want to let them down. You want to win so bad that it's almost hard to, to focus on what needs to be done to win because it's only about the result. And if you win, it's, a, you are the best. And if you lose, it's so disappointing. And, and I'm someone I really, really try to focus just on, on what needs to be done on each, you know, preparation for each match, um, preparation for e each next point when I'm in the match, just sticking to the game plan. Because if you just, you just gotta, you just got to do what needs to be done technically, physically, and mentally. It, it it doesn't matter if you think about winning or losing. That's just something on the sideline. In the end, you got to play the ball in the right spot in the right moment. Of course. <laughs> and uh, I try really to keep it that simple when I play. But it it's hard if there is so much going on on the sideline and if there is so much spoken ahead of a match and after a match, that makes it really hard. But of course, if you're successful in it, it's it's unbelievable what the crowd what the people give back to you uh, when you yeah when you do it well and when you win of course and especially that the year before you lost in final against like um another german player yeah. angelique kerber so yeah. Was... yeah i don't think anyone expected uh first of all no one expected in that year 16 that i would come out of the qualies and make it to the final and then surely no one expected that i would win the tournament the year after i think it's a very um yeah um, interesting and, and special path that I went there in Stuttgart and also you have to see I mean I played this tournament I don't know how many 10 times before or so always like of losing course. in the quali uh, I mean this was one of the tournaments where I literally went and I I knew the how much is the first round prize money because I always picked that up <laughs> I went there, I lost it, and I went back home. That was every year the same, and it was frustrating because I really wanted to play well there, but it was just not my surface. The pressure, I could never handle it and, and all these things. Um, and then suddenly in 16, yeah, I, I started uh, to play unbelievable there. And, um, <clears throat> yeah, it, it, it's, it's something incredible that, that, uh, it's, it's the, probably the nicest really throughout your career the nicest moments you have in this sport playing your best tennis in your hometown with a crowd that's just um they are out of their mind i mean they're like it's like a, a, they create an atmosphere in in an arena that's like you're stepping out of time for a moment and that's something that uh, not a lot of times in your career you have these moments i think of course that's amazing And I, I bet they were pushing you as well as a, as a German player. They were behind your back. Yeah, I mean, exactly. In one, in one hand, uh, you, you feel a lot of pressure because you don't want to let uh, anybody down. But on the other hand, of course, they are like, they're carrying you like a wave also through the hard moments and you, you ex excel, like you play. You play, you start to play also once you get in a, in a flow where you, where you feel like, Hey, I'm playing really well today. I can do this. Then, then they carry you like a wave and, and it, it gets, uh, some kind uh, of ecstatic <laughs> points okay. where you start to play out of your mind. And this is only possible because the, the, um, the atmosphere that the spectators create and because there's so much in your back. Of course. Um, so shortly after that win, you unfortunately went to injure your knee and yeah. you were out um, during the rest of the se 2017 season. Um, I can imagine it was like really a tough moment for you, especially after winning this title. And also it was also just before Roland Garros. Mm -hmm. um, how did you deal with this period of, of your career? Um, and in what way would you say that the injury impacted you like mentally? as well as physically, of course. Um, yeah, I'm, you know, it was for sure an unfortunate moment uh, that happened. Uh, still, people say like, yeah, um, if and could have and would have. I'm not a fan of that. Um, you know, I, I, li I could have gone to Paris two weeks later and lost first round. Uh, it, it, no one knows what would have happened. Um, but for sure, what is certainly was, uh, it was unf an unfortunate timing. I had a, 
I, I had my way worked or I had worked up my way, um, into the top 30, um, and, and had, I was really on a roll. My game was great at that time. And of course that injury, um, it, it was like an ax going through a, uh, like a, just a flowing thing and stopped it very abrupt. And, um, what I felt in that moment, was first of all a, a really like a uh, yeah sort of panic that I said oh no this is some I mean I felt right away that it's a severe injury and it's probably the the ACL um because if I w- always would have imagined it feeling that way <laughs> <laughs> so I knew exactly okay this season is over the minute I fell and that was kind of a panic feeling that oh no you worked so hard and now this and the second feeling was interestingly enough, okay, then you're gonna use the time in another way that's, that's like, that w- brings you forward. So I had, uh, which is not necessarily my, um, how can I say? I'm, I'm a, a pretty, although may, people might not think that, but I'm a really pessimistic person. I always see the worst case scenario and I try to find all the ways not to make the worst case scenario <laughs> happen. So I was surprised a little bit also by myself that I'm not um, reacting very negatively to this and being like, oh, how can this happen to me and all that? And then kind of got to work your way out of that hole. I didn't have to do that. I was very positive. Maybe it was because I I, I had, you know, um, collected so many positive uh, feelings and emotions and results and all that with me in the in the months before that I was like okay that's what it is it is very unfortunate we can all agree on that but that's life and you got to make the best out of it now that was right away literally from the moment I was in in on the barrier where they carried me off the court um or maybe not that moment, but maybe in the hospital <laughs> after when I got the final diagnosis. I mean, in that moment, I was just in a, in a lot of pain and I was, uh, just very, um, how in shock. But then literally an hour later, I started to have a pretty positive um, attitude toward the whole thing, which was for sure, uh, um, uh, how can I say, um, it was definitely helpful, you know, to get me started in a good rehab, also mentally. And, um, yeah, I, I, I did that. I, I had also down phases during, I mean, it was like an eight month rehab phase. Um, and I had also really low points there down the road. But I, uh, two days after I was, uh, you know, I had surgery right away and all that. I had books all around me in the hospital. I was reading. I finally had time for all the things that I never had time for all the years. Yeah. And that was a great thing also. It, it, it's tough to say that because, it, you know, I was successful and all that. But there are a lot of sacrifices you do to play tennis. And suddenly I could just read all the psychological books that I wanted to read. I could just have friends visit and just chat for hours with them. <laughs> um, I was home and I had time for all these things. And uh, that was that was really a great thing about the injury. Um but of course, you know, you would like to choose that time and not say, ah, now uh, you have this time eight months. <laughs> that was not great <laughs> about it. But was not all, uh, you know, I made the best out of it, I think. Of course, of course. So that that's great to hear. And right now, um, coming back and doing all of the rehab, do you see yourself as a different player today after the injury? And what did you take away from that period? What did you learn from it? Yeah, you become a different person when you have this kind of injury. Um, you learn, you learn that you have not everything under control. You learn that it's not about, it's not only the injury. You think the problem is the injury that you have in that moment. And your biggest physical problem is that spot in your body and that's not that's an illusion i had more problems i mean of course the that injury is is for the for a couple of months your biggest problem but you carry out other problems from this kind of severe injury so basically your body 
needs, I, I would say I needed one year to get the knee fixed and I needed at least another year to get the rest of the body fixed. It's a, it's a co complete system that collapses. Your body is such a machine and it's, it's um, adjusted to all the weaknesses you have and it's uh, adjusting them. And if you, if you just, if, if there is one screw that you change, everything else w has to change with it. And that's nothing that happens overnight. So you really have to learn that everything is connected in your body. And that's, a, that's, a, that's tough for the mind. You know, if your knee feels great and you think, okay, that problem is solved, but you keep having problems in all different other places of the body, that, that gets uh, tough on your brain then. And you're like, why is not, you know, why can it not just be like before? And so that's really a process. You, you go through it for, yeah, for years, basically. I would say I needed two to three years until I was really at back at that point where how it was similar to what it was before the injury. And that's something you, you know, mentally you adjust and you're like, okay, um, yeah, you, you, you learn things about your body. You learn things about your mindset and, and, uh, and it definitely, you, you definitely step out at the, uh, at the end different as a different person than you stepped in. And that's the case for me right now. You know, the injury was three years ago. Um, <clears throat> the body has adjusted. I have really, I'm, I'm a really fit player again, but I'm also a couple years older and there are other problems that, that are my daily, um, that are part of my daily, uh, things that I have to deal with now. So, um, but, but, you know, I think injuries, they belong to sports. There is no good athlete that didn't have to do, had have to deal with, uh, more or less severe injuries. And that's something, yeah, it also, you know, it, you have to put it in the, I'd put it in the drawer prof professionalism. It belongs to the sport. Um, it's not always healthy professional sports and you got to be able to deal with it. Otherwise it's, it's not, it's not what you should do. Of course. So would you say that? You see yourself as a stronger player now um, after being through all of this. I would say so. Yeah, I would say I'm. Um, I I toughened up. <laughs> let's say I uh, strong in. It depends on what how you see the word. Um, I'm I'm playing. I was maybe playing better in that phase, like just tennis wise. But I got. Um, I hardened up. I I learned to um deal with really bad uh mental stages i learned to be deal with really bad physical stages and all these things i think they they make you tougher and they they also make you rethink how much do i really want to do this whole thing this whole drill being a professional athlete how long do i want to do this um you you overthink your goals and your motivations and i think that is always a good thing and that makes you um if you commit to the sport again, if you don't give up and you, let's say, recommit to it, you commit in a strong way. And I think that's what happened with me. I, I know why I'm playing and I know that I work really hard after that injury to get where I am now because I committed to it and because I know why I'm doing this. And that's that's something that makes you very strong from the inside. Of course, of course. And looking at where you are today, I mean... 2020 has been a really good year for you in tennis, despite like the pandemic. First, you winning your first woman double Grand Slam title in the U.S. Open, mm -hmm. um, and then reaching out like the, for the first time the quarterfinal in Roland Garros. Um, so it just showed that uh, you came back like stronger. Um, what is it like for you to play both a single and double tournament at the same time? Yeah, I mean you know. This is, this is, um, how can you say a little, uh, is a dilemma story. <laughs> this, I really, I like to play singles because you are the only one responsible for what's happening and it's extremely physical and there is nobody else but you uh, who you can rely to and the game is very intense. But I have to say my whole life, I love doubles as well. I'm a, I would say I'm a really good doubles player. I have a, I have a mind for it. Uh, in German, we say a nose for it. Yeah. I smell what of people course. are thinking to do in the next step and I can like anticipate it really well. I kind of have just a, a, a um, 
I have a feeling for the doubles game and uh and so I really love both and I think they're they're like almost different sports like uh singles doubles mixed all of the three are completely different games tactically physically uh, mentally and um and it's a bit sad that I really um physically it's hard for me to play well in both I can play singles and doubles at the same tournament or in a grand slam singles doubles mixed but it makes you tired and um not not for one day or two days but over the period of two weeks it it's really tiring and um and so a lot of times I have to select which one is my higher priority. And until now, I'm putting singles in my higher priority because, um, you know, for singles, the time is now. Doubles, I could also play in a, still in a few years where maybe physically I'm not as fit anymore as I, as I am right now. So I always push the doubles a little bit on the spot of second priority, which okay. is sad because I think I could make, if I made it a first priority, I could probably win many more titles. But just until now, I, I felt like I always had to make a choice bet between the two. And that's kind of what I'm doing. I'm trying to play both, but, um, but singles is definitely as of right now, still my higher priority. Um, and, and maybe one day I'll be a double specialist. I don't know. Maybe one day I'll, I'll switch it completely, but until I can, I can feel like I can play well in singles, this is going to be my, my higher priority. Of course, of course. Um, and looking back at everything you've been through this far through your career, do you have one or maybe like few favorite moments? <laughs> yeah, of course. The favorite moments, they are really, um, they are really uh, a lot of times connected to your to your big wins i try to disconnect that i try to enjoy the time i'm you know playing the time i'm on court and i try not always to connect it to winning or you know having the biggest best result you had but it is in the end like that those big victories they give you that adrenaline and that excitement that only a victory a big victory can give yeah that's the 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 point of the whole thing so if i if i have to sum a few uh, uh, yeah my best moments up it would definitely be the 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 moment when i realized that I played a drop shot on the line as match point in, in, in Stuttgart 2017. And when I realized that ball was on the line, uh, that were, and when this crowd started jumping up, mm -hmm. that was, that was one of the best moments I had. I had also one moment that I really have very well in, in my mind. It's the first time I reached, um, uh, third round in Australian Open or in a Grand Slam in general that was against Jankovic. I think it was in 2015. Um, 15 or 16. Now I'm not sure about that. And that was one of the, that was the first time where I felt like, okay, I'm really on the big stage now. I arrived in a third round of a slam. That's a big deal. And I was probably as excited as anyone could be. And it, and, and I was new to it. It was my first big win. So I, I was like jumping like a flummy <laughs> up <laughs> and down. So, and of course, and of course, then I have to say now winning the, the title with Vera, uh, Swanareva, um, uh, this were, this was a really nice, like intimate moment between two older players that have, you know, made a great comeback. That's a nice thing to share. And I felt really like I'm there with the right person at the right time in the right spot. That was a very nice moment too. Okay. That's amazing. Yeah. And so we talk about, um, the fact like you've been really like successful and you accomplished like many things during your career so far. But, um, what really like, what would you say that success mean to you? Is that like you talk about winning the title? Or is that traveling? Is that playing the sport that you love? Or is it something else? I think to me, success is, um, when you are, when you're loving what you're doing, that's real success. There is, there is two ways of success. It's, it's the result that you have and what, what people outside, um, uh, think is successful. And that's pretty much only the results. Yeah. They, they think you are successful if you, if like now you win titles, you win tournaments, you, you, you have a good ranking. That's success for, from an outside perspective. And, and you get a lot for that. Like you get a lot of pats on the, on the shoulder and on the back that you did great and all that. 
But then there is this other that's to me more important. It's like a that's what you think is success. Are that's what what you are proud of. Are you happy with it? All these that's that I think what is more important, because um, it is possible that you sit and you have hundred trophies and that's all great, but you're still somewhat sad because there's something missing. That is actually possible. So I think there is I think there is this other thing that is it's what how you define success and what what do you feel like, um, that you were successful in? And for me, that is that you are able to to love what you're doing and that you are um, enjoying the, the path that you're on apart from the results, you know, okay. and that is something that's more difficult because also me, I feel like you're always running after the result. You want to win. You want to have that, um, that, you know, pay, let's say the piece of on, on black and white, the result on the paper that you did that. But to get there, you got to let it go. You got to play for the moment. You got to play for the joy of it. You got to work really hard, of course, but you have to still be able to have this inner motivation to just be there and love to do what you're doing. And this is something that I experience is very difficult in tennis because for me, uh, the traveling and, and all these, the lifestyle that you have with tennis, it's not always easy. Sometimes I, I hate it. Yeah. And, um, and that's always a challenge to find the balance. What, what you need, what you personally need, um, to feel happy and to enjoy your job and basically your life because in, in tennis, you cannot, divide uh, that in other professional sports also not but particularly not in tennis T your job and your life it's melting together it's one thing of course. and that's not always easy so I would define my my success if I you know the moments where I'm or the time frames where I'm able to manage that that I'm really enjoying what I'm doing on the court as well as off the court. And that always, in the end, funnily enough, that leads also to good results. If you're able to do that, to have a good time, to enjoy yourself, to, you know, have good relationships with your friend or your partner that you're traveling with, then you also have the results in the end. It's always like that. Okay. Okay. That sounds, that sounds good. Um, So in terms of the mental side, like being a professional player, it's known to be like very tough because you are alone on the court and you are just like facing your opponent. Um, do you have like a mental coach with you to work and to prepare for the tournament? Um, yeah, I think the mental aspect is very important. And I have had over time several uh, sports psychologists that I was working with. Uh, I have nobody traveling to the tournaments with me on a regular basis. I never had that. Um, but I have people uh, sometimes in Germany. I have a sports psychologist here in Germany I was working with. I had also other ones, Americans, Australians that I've worked with, you know, over um, Skype or, or just over the phone and when I needed it. And I think that's a very important thing. It can it doesn't have to be a sports psychologist. It can be anybody who who puts your view into perspective Who can, who is able to, you shift your mindset back on a, on a healthier track when it gets off track. I think that's very important for any athlete. And I was uh, trying to take advantage of this kind of support throughout my, uh, definitely my second uh, half of the career. Okay. And the fact that like you've been studying psychology and you have a degree on it, do you think it helped you uh, as a tennis player? For sure, it's not bad. Like, um, I feel like I definitely got a new perspective on a lot of things through the, through studying psychology. But in the end, the, the problems or the difficulties and the challenges we tennis players experience on the tour, they are very specific. Uh, they, it's, it's like you, you need, um, it's not like a general uh, advice can help you. You need to have a really specific solution for your specific situation. And there, I don't feel like the general study that I did is is very helpful. It's more like kind of good general knowledge to have in the background. But if you're 
on the court or off the court having um, having difficulties, that's nothing that will help you. Then it's really time important to have um, experienced people who have been in this kind of situation already or who have, you know, uh, dealt with athletes that have been in a similar situation. Um, I mean, literally, you can talk to a good friend also. Or so people just that, that have an outside perspective on the situation that you are, you are, you know, trying to deal with. And that can, that can do already an, a big difference in your, um, how you see things and how you also then handle the things. Um, if you get, if you're able to talk with someone about it. And, and as I said, great if it's a professional psychologist, but it doesn't need to be. Yeah. Okay. Sounds good. Um, and one thing that is really important too, like to get past those tough moments or challenges that athletes face during like career is also the motivation, this fire to, to kind of like keep going. Um, growing up, like what or who was your biggest inspiration or motivation? I was a fan of Steffi Graf because I, yeah, I admired all the things that she, the dominance she showed and, and all the, the victories and the, um, achievements she, um, she got through her career. But, uh, but I was never like, uh, how can I say? I was never like crazy about just one person that I was really wanting to be like that. I mean, I just, admired Steffi Graf and she was German and she was the best German player but it was not that I had my whole uh, room full of posters of her or anything I never had this um, idolizing phase so much it's more in general that I watch good athletes the best in their field and it's just in generally uh, in general more like um, motivating me or um, fascinating me but uh I kind of had more that feeling when I was a teenager that I want to make my own steps. You know, I'm not Steffi Graf or Anke Huber, the people that were the best ones back then. Um, I, I kind of try to make my own mark or be my own brand in a way. Okay. And, uh, but of course I, I just watched all other athletes also from other sports and, and, um, and try to see how, what, what do they do? How do they look? You know, how, watch the athleticism and all that. And, and today, like, where do you keep having that motivation to keep going, to keep traveling to those tournament? Like, is that still like because of the passion that you have for tennis in general? Yeah, I, I think so. There is a deep, um, how can I say I have, you know, this drill, this working with the body and working directly to achieve something that is in your own hands also only. Yeah. This is a great thing. I have really trouble to let that go. <laughs> like, let's say if I would do, you know, something else, I would be not as independent. I would be um, more depending on what other people want from me. Um, and, uh, and I would have to make more of a schedule with other people. Uh, and the other day I was training, I'm in the off season right now and I had a really hard training day and I was like, doing exercises, uh, running right and left. I mean, I was lying half dead on the floor afterwards. And then I packed my bags and I went to the locker room. And that is one of these moments that I know why I'm doing this. I live this this physical aspect also, everything about it, like to train so hard that you can not stand anymore and you have to lie down this uh, this uh, technical aspect to to make that little thing um a little bit better that you you know you know that in a certain situation in a point you need that shot and you can play it right now but you're working that you will be able to play it maybe in a few months and these little technical things and while you're doing the technical thing you're breathing and you have a like pulse 200 yeah? yeah this all these things and the the exhaustion and but knowing what you're doing it for all these things that's why I'm training I I love that I live that and I would be very sad not to be able to do that anymore or um or um yeah for whatever reason I can't do it anymore so I think 
until I can do it and until I think I, I'm able to have good results with it, I really want to play. Yeah. And it's something that's deep from the inside. I know I can train harder than other people. I know I have some creativity that other people don't have and all that. That's like keeps motivating you and striving you to kind of put that into some kind of result. Yeah. Yeah, of course. And I actually saw that picture on Instagram you put a um, few days ago about you laying on the ground after that second week of preseason. Yeah, <laughs> that was exactly exactly that was exactly that moment uh, after that when I went to the locker room, and that really shows me. You know, I, I, it could be also the opposite. It could be that you are you're getting your stuff and you're going to the locker room and you're thinking. Jesus Christ, what what the hell I'm doing that for? Why am I still doing that? I mean, I'm 30 years old. I Everything hurts. I don't want to do that anymore. And that would be fine. I would accept that. I would say, okay, that's cool. Then, you you know, we do it one more year or, or also not. You can pack your bag today and, and don't do it anymore. It's fine. There is, I really believe the athlete's career, it's a certain phase. In tennis, It's until the mid thirties, maybe now until the late thirties, even how you can see, but it doesn't matter. You, you decide which, when the phase starts and you decide when it ends. And there is a life after that. There is tennis. It's, it's a, it's a micro life embedded in, in a bigger life. And you have to realize at some point the other life is coming for you. You have to, you have to deal with that and you choose the time. And, and, uh, I, it would be, you know, I listen to what's coming from my heart a lot of times and that would be acceptable if, if from the heart was coming, listen, I, I was doing that too long now. I don't want to do that anymore. But then there is this practice and I'm feeling the opposite. I'm feeling like, Hey, that's really, I love to do that. That's what I'm, that's why I'm doing this whole thing. And that's a great thing. It's, it's right now. Maybe tomorrow it's not like that anymore. I don't know, but it's just, you got to listen to your heart and the, the motivation has to come from really deep inside. Only then you can have good results also. Of course. Of course. Um, so playing tennis like your entire life for now, um, what impact would you say that tennis has had on your life and, What did you learn from playing tennis? Wow, uh, I think um, for me, tennis, but for other, you know, professional athletes, any any professional sport, it has a, a, a huge impact on your personality, on how you how you do things in life, how you deal with challenges, and um, yeah, basically the person you become. And I think um, also here in in the U.S. they you know the professional sport is embedded much better in 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 the society and and has a high respect in Germany. Unfortunately, unfortunately, it's still not like that. I think um, in in Germany we have to see the value of the let's say the school you go through in professional sports. Um, you learn to be disciplined, you learn to handle challenges, you learn to listen to that inner motivation that you have. You don't go, you don't go to these places that I go or other professional players go. If, if someone else is telling you to do that, you go to a certain point, but then you won't go anymore because the motivation has to come from deep inside. And all these uh, things that add in an, in a single sport like tennis, You have to learn to um, basically have a little business. Yeah, you have people that work for you. You have to pay them. You have to have finances under control. Um, maybe you have people like a manager or so to help you, but but you really kind of learn to run a small business and you learn team. Uh, you know, team. How do you say? Um, uh, things that happen in a team that to be fair to others to you know, play with others or accept and tolerance others. All these things you learn in professional sports, they help you for life. Okay. I mean, that's a school, normal people and normal doesn't mean, I, I don't want to say that as a negative thing. I, th I think it's just people that n don't go through professional athletes' uh, lifestyle, let's say, they don't learn these things or they learn them much later and much slower. And an athlete learns them in a short period of time, within 10 years. I feel like I lived already three lives, you know. <laughs> um, you. Yeah, because it's going so fast and every every week you have a high and a low and everything in between. And these qualities that you learn, I think they are extremely valuable for life, 
for your um, also for business that you do after your career and also for your private life yeah because you learn a lot about yourself in extreme situations and that you can you can deal with yourself better and that helps you know for your relationships and all these things also so i would say the things you learn as a professional athlete they they're i i can't ex express enough how valuable they are and i think you can make a lot out of it far over your career, your active career. And this is something where like, particularly in Germany, I think that potential is extremely underestimated also for businesses to, um, to see those ex athletes as, you know, great, uh, workforce or, or human, how do you say, uh, uh, human force. And, um, and in, in other countries, like in the States or so, that's much more, that has a much higher value. Um, then in, in Germany, I would wish that that be, gets a much higher value through time. I, I, I have one experience when I finished my school on the last day when I had all my exams written and passed everything, I went, I wanted to go out of the school. Basically, I was on my way to the exit and I passed one teacher that was teaching me the last years and he was really unsupportive of the whole tennis and he always was, you know, he was not happy that we were missing the lesson, the school and the lessons with him and all that. And he put his hand, he, he asked me, what, what do you want to do now that you're finished with your school? And I said, well, I, I want to become a pro athlete. And now I finished my school and I think I can give it a shot. And he put his hand on my shoulder and he said, girl, you better do something real, like a real job, something right. Don't waste your time. Wow. And that was That's a so moment nice. I looked in this guy. He was maybe, I don't know, 56 years. And I looked in his eyes and I said, Wow, that's that's an attitude. I mean, maybe I I go nowhere with this sport, but for sure I learned something on the way. And I really sometimes I wonder now when I I'm not very like I, I I'm you know I'm proud of what I achieved, but I'm not someone who is bragging or anything. But sometimes it crosses my mind if he's still I don't know if he's still alive. <laughs> you know that was when was that? That was like uh yeah no yeah 15 years ago i don't know i hope he's still alive i wonder if he's sitting in front of the tv and and watching me and and seeing what you know what i've become um and the positives about it i don't know um and and it's not only that you're holding up the trophy in tv it's all the things that you learn on that road and i think he would he could be very proud of all the things i've learned but it's not seen like that And that's a sad thing. And I hope that would change in this country, you know, at some point, because it's the best school that you can go through what you learn as a professional athlete. Of course, of course. And having been in the US, I can completely agree that the mentality towards uh, sport and athlete are different compared to Germany, but also I think in, in Europe in general. Uh, France or Spain. Um. Yeah, I mean, in 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 <laughs> in the US, it's the opposite. Like, you can be such a terrible player, and you say, "Yeah, I'm a tennis player," and the people say, "Wow, that's amazing! You're you're <laughs> like a pro." Like, you know, they go crazy about you can you can put two balls in the courts and you're a pro. Like, <laughs> it's the opposite extreme. But but uh, the the really positive thing about this is that you know, I mean, we all know sports are really healthy for the body and for the mind and all that and um it's just embedded really well in uh in 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 the school system already and in society everybody is doing some kind of sport in school and um and that's just a great thing and if if a professional athlete in the end turns out of it great if not you know they did some some good sports they they learned something about um being in a team or being also an individual athlete and they they learned a lot of things yeah the only thing is when you become really a professional athlete then it's the on the edge of healthiness <laughs> of <laughs> then course. it becomes uh, physically and mentally it becomes uh, it goes to that borderline where you are really pushing your body over the the limits that are really healthy and also your mind at times yeah <laughs> of course I, i i will say i could imagine but i can so i will <laughs> but i will trust you for sure yeah. um and and my last question so this podcast is about sharing professional athlete unique story uh, to show that everyone's mm -hmm. journey is different 
so if you could give one piece of advice to people who are listening and have big dreams, but they don't really know how, how to go on and how to reach them, what would it be? That is a good question. Um, you know, I think, I believe that um, professional sports, or let's say in general, in general, life is about finding your way and doing your thing and being happy in what what is your dream. And that can be anything. That can be professional sports. That can be painting pictures in Timbuktu on the beach. It doesn't matter. You have to do what you believe in, what you think you are good at, and what you love to do. And then if you do that, that makes you successful also. But that's the second thing. That shouldn't be the main main priority. And in order to achieve that, to find your path, it is very important to listen to your heart and to learn, to be open with your eyes and ears, to get better, improve. You don't never, nobody knows everything at the beginning and you need to make mistakes, but you need to be willing to learn and, and that's important. You have to learn from other people. But you have to know when is it important that I listen to myself and when is it good to take some good advice from other people. And that's a very that's a very fine line. And no one can tell you who is that right person or when is it a right a good advice and when it is is it not a good advice. But I think it's never good just to rely on only what other people are saying. You have to listen to your heart and you have it's okay to make mistakes, but you have to you have to do in the end what you believe in and find try to get guided a little bit by good people around you. That's in the end what what leads you to happiness and that's what leads you also to success then finally. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Perfect. That's a really good advice. So if people want to follow you or get in touch with you, uh, how they can do that? Is that like on Instagram mostly or Twitter? Well, I mean, I'm on the, you know, the typical social media platforms, uh, Facebook, not so much anymore, but really on Instagram. I have a website also, um, and you can, you can click and, and shoot me an email there or send me a message on Instagram. That's usually, um, uh, maybe not right away as you <laughs> experience, but I will reply at some point. But, uh, yeah, I, I probably get it even more easy if, if, uh, someone sends me an email through my website. Um, and, um, yeah, I'm always, you know, happy to share, um, hopefully good advice with, uh, with people who need it who, or who ask for it. I'm, uh, trying to, to take my time and try to be, um, yeah, someone who, who, you know, shares experience and doesn't keep all the information that I've gained through my career for themselves. I think it's important to, um, yeah, to give also some, some of the things that you learned to others of course perfect so we will put like all of the link in the description anywhere of your website and your your social medias and uh, yes of course you give like really good advice like already today and so i wanted just to thank you for joining on our podcast uh, it was really a pleasure to to talk to you and uh, to hear more about your story yes very welcome i enjoyed it too <laughs>